Welcome to the Unconsumed Podcast. I'm Lee Corning. I'm here with my good friend, Kurt Steinhorst. Kurt is the author of Amazon bestseller, Can I Have Your Attention? And co-founder and president of FocusWise.com. Thanks for being on the show, Kurt. Thanks for having me on, Lee. I'm excited to be here. Perfect, man. Well, hey, I I knew you. I, I became acquainted with you in probably what was that, 2013, right around there. Yeah, it's hard to believe. It's been five years. Well, we were. I felt like I was a child then, and I would have been like 27. <laughs> uh, but you're you're 35 years old, so to have an Amazon bestseller at this age is uh, amazing for the record uh, and I'll let you talk to that more in a minute but when I first met you you were beginning the cycles of wanting to get into public speaking wanting to get into uh, you know corporate events speaking like that and that completely took off in those last five years so I'd love to hear about how that went how you got into that and then uh, prior to that like where are you from you're you're in Frisco Texas right now and I'd love to hear a little bit of the story about uh, prior to when you were at a and and then how you got to maybe where I found you at 27, and then this, this, cat, uh, this catapult that you've been on for the last five years. Well, it's been a little bit crazy, and uh, all stories are easier to hold in hindsight. They certainly, right. it certainly wasn't nearly as clear as it has um, turned out to be or as I can make it sound. Um, well, I, you know what, I'll, I can back up and just and give and start at the beginning. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> although I just want to warn everyone, I'm, I'm not going to start uh, into a year by year starting at age one, <laughs> but I will start um, <laughs> by saying that I was born in Plano, uh, Dallas area, uh, Texas. And um, really middle school is this funny moment for me where I was sure I was going to play uh, I was going to be a professional athlete, but unfortunately, Obviously. I peaked in eighth grade. Right. You know, <laughs> not exactly impressive. And I, uh, I had these uh, speech and drama teacher who approached me when I was in seventh grade and said they thought I should do speech and debate and speaking at tournaments. And I, was, I said, "That's what nerds do. I'm not going to do that." Um, and they said, "Well, just go to the the city tournament at the end of the year." And I happened to win city against most. Uh, mostly people that were a year older than me. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was just this really, um, this defining moment for me where I realized that what I loved to do and it was, and what I had a unique uh, talent for that I needed to develop was to, to uh, understand how ideas can be communicated and how, how we speak and organize those ideas. And so um, really it, it was this journey through uh, Texas A&M and undergrad at I had a chance to be president of my class, which means I, I got to speak quite often and um, was studying rhetoric and communication and uh, and then started moving in a couple ways. Uh, one was as I left university, I jumped into the talent agency world and was first an agent at uh, for booking people on the speaker side. So if you were had a big platform, we would book you for speeches. and the audacity of a 23-year-old, 24-year-old uh, who didn't know better, I, um, I approached the owner of the business and after hearing someone who we booked for $50,000 that everyone said it was good and it was the worst speech I'd ever heard. And I said, I can, start a, I can start a revenue stream for you that will help our clients. And so if we can book them but they can't speak, let me write their speeches and coach them for a commission. And if we... I can, um, if we can't book them, but they can speak, then let me be the person who helps them with their message in terms mm -hmm. of how they position it in the public. And um, we gave it a shot and it worked and it started me on this journey towards uh, being a speech coach and a speech writer. And so that was the plan. And honestly, when we, when we met uh, before I was ever even thinking about my own platform for speaking, um, really it was me leaving a big agency and starting my own to right. work with people uh, mainly in sports. And, and so that was the iteration there. Uh, the big pivot for me where all of a sudden I'm being asked to speak is that I was asked to join a group that was the largest in the nation on generational studies. And uh, I became uh, basically the cheap version of someone who was uh, the world's leader on the topic of millennials and was able to contribute to the, to the team and then speak. And all of a sudden the speaking is, um, is taking over every aspect of my business and life. 
And uh, all of that would seemingly have nothing to do with the topic that I uh, think on and speak on all the time, which is on attention and distraction. Right. But, um, it's, it's funny how, how that took place. Really, that was the confluence of my personal and professional journey. And it was a side thing for me. Um, when I started my own business, all of a sudden, I have, having been diagnosed with ADD, but never having been medicated, I found myself just um, uh, no longer capable of using the tricks that I had learned along the way to um, overcome the volume of things I had to get done. And so it was either move back home with my parents, like everyone else in my generation, or it was to figure out how to get on top of it. And so um, I started just learning my own strategies around distraction and attention while speaking and, uh, or excuse me, while coaching and writing on communication. Mm -hmm. And then um, you add in generations and uh, there's this weird confluence that comes to how's technology and communication changing uh, the way that we, uh, what we pay attention to and distraction. And I started being asked to talk on that as a side thing and it started being a bigger thing. And then all of a sudden, a few years later, um, it's all that I'm doing all the time. <laughs> well, so you, you hit me with something earlier there. It was the, uh, the audacity of a 23 year old to go to the manager of the company, <laughs> whatever that title was and say, Hey, I want to do this instead of what you hired me to do. Was the was that like a moment where like if he says no I'm gonna get fired or is that a moment where it's like if he says no who cares? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I I I knew I wasn't gonna get fired. Um, it's it's actually in hindsight. So having studied and spoke, sp spoken so much on generations and millennials, the mm -hmm. reputation around entitlement makes me look back and realize how entitled this could have sounded. Um, but. In, in, the, in that context, there were a couple of things that were working in my favor. The first one is that uh, when I jumped into that business, um, I had some success early on and I proved to the team that I was willing to really dive in and do the really hard work. Mm -hmm. um, so I was doing cold calls and I was just pounding the pavement. And so I'd earned kind of this reputation inside the, the organization as this young, um, hard driving up and comer who could be trusted because he would work. So, it, you know, it, this isn't because I'm great. It's just, it's worked out. I, I honestly, the biggest thing is I just don't want to embarrass myself. I was like, I, I don't want to be the guy that peaked in college. So right. I'm going to jump in and, and we'll see what happens. And, and so then when I approached them about it, I, I think naivety was probably the, uh, I, I'm guessing some of them, uh, the owner and the executive team probably thought <laughs> kind of a laugh, like, oh, of course he's, and he's been here six months or he's been here a year and he already knows how to do it. But the truth is they, they were, you know, they were really supportive. They said, well, let's give it a try on the, on the side and, and we'll see what happens. And then slowly it just, it grew. So trust was already there, um, which gave me a little bit of, of leeway and it was a oh, good a boost, boost to start. start. Yeah. That's awesome. For sure. Yeah. So we, when you're doing that and then, so, um, we're saying this, this, let's start at the frame where you're like, uh, just starting doing that. Uh, the, the speech writing and the coaching on the side. So did that give you the impetus to move from, uh, did that launch your speaking career at all or where's the next, where's the next link? Yeah, great question. And, and this is a, there's a couple observations that I have uh, in regard to the speech coaching and speech writing. So um, the first thing I realized pretty quickly is that there was, the, there was a large volume of information all saying the same thing in the speech writing and speech coaching world. Mm -hmm. And right. um, I was the beneficiary of the, uh, the best high school debate coach in the United States. Uh, when I was in high school, we were the number one program. And so I, I had a chance to really learn a lot of the basics. But one thing I've learned along the way is like, you can ask anybody who says they like to speak and they'll give you tips on speaking. And, and um, but there's actually just not many people who do the extra work. And so uh, that means I was, I, I basically did this deep dive into, because if I was going to have to coach someone who had won a gold medal in the Olympics, I'm 24 years old, then I need to overcompensate. Um, my youth needs to be overcompensated for by my knowledge. And so I just, I, I literally was um, reading and audio booking and analyzing everything around the subject and pretty quickly jumped from within the subject to one step outside of it into psychology and neuroscience okay. so that my opinions and perspective was um, I felt more rooted than a lot of the classic 
Toastmasters ideas, which are helpful, but also not helpful. Um, like when they tell you 12 things to do uh, and, you're, and yet you can't really think of them all. So, um, so really that was like the first big link was diving in to get a really deep foundation. There's a difference between being good at communicating and actually understanding and having a framework for it. Um, at that point, I had no plans to be a speaker myself. I did not, uh, I, I, I really thought I, I haven't lost a limb. I haven't landed the plane on the Hudson. I haven't won, you know, I haven't become the president. Like I, I don't have anything that we- Those are the precursors, yeah. Yeah, so I just thought I was gonna coach. The, the, the shift from coaching only to speaking was the day that the generational team said, we really want your, you involved and we want you to, as someone who has a unique combination in that you understand the generational trends, you study communication, you understand what it takes to perform on stage and you know what a client needs. Um, like all of a sudden I realized all these weird independent things uh, had a unique value in a specific spot. And yeah. So that was the job. There's a ton of, there's a ton of value to being that uh, kind of a mutant, right? Like you can do a lot of different things and that makes you somehow super capable in some capacity that you didn't even mean to be. And we yeah. see that all the time with these entrepreneur stories. It's like, yeah, I was a little bit of this and that turns out to make all the difference when I was trying to do what I set out to do in the first place. So, yeah. One other thing I'd want to ask you about is, so you're a, you're a professional speaker. I speak every day, but I wouldn't call myself a professional speaker by any means. It's, you know, in sales meetings or uh, even this podcast or any, any context where you're just speaking in front of a lot of people. What I find is when you read off those 12 rules of Toastmasters or what it says in the communication books or even what you um, pull up online is that the the millennial generation or millennial plus one or even millennial minus one, I guess, is uh, super good at picking up on authenticity. So if you look like you're following a set of rules, it breaks down your message a little bit. Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Or a little uh, yes of both? And, yeah, yeah, yes and no. So I, I think it's, it's a great question. It's one of the, what I would consider a major misnomer mm. of what, what actually uh, creates in an audience the perception of inauthenticity. Um, the first, the, the foundation that I would have to say is that there's nothing natural about standing in front of a lot of people and having them stare at you. And um, so there's nothing about that situation that lends itself towards people saying, you're gonna get my most authentic self. Um, and so in particular, what that naturally does, when we, when we wing it, when we go up on stage and are not prepared and don't understand um, and haven't developed the practical, what we're actually doing is we're increasing the likelihood that what they're gonna see um, and what they're gonna experience is, um, are the, is the anxiety and the nerves that come from that uncomfortable experience. Right. Um, I, I heard it. Uh, I heard someone say one time that um, if it looks easy, then it was really hard. If it if it looks like hard, it was probably pretty easy. And <laughs> so, I, I think it's really important when it comes to speaking that uh, we don't want to we don't want to get into the the process of where uh, the the trees but the, we miss the forest for the trees. Like, uh, there's a lot of people that come out of a Toastmasters, which by the way is an amazing class, depending on which one you're in. Uh, I, I've and, never been in. I'm just I'm just. Yeah, it, anything that gets you in front of people and practicing, yeah. like getting rid of ums and uhs is good. Getting rid of um, how do we handle our hands, are, they're good. But, but when we, we start to make every single one, you can start, I see these people that become um, professional speakers and that, that they hit every best practice, right. but they actually do miss the core. And so my perspective is very much in line with saying like, how do we make sure that we are eliminating habits and eliminating um, ways of preparing and natural things that we're doing that actually erode our authenticity. Mm -hmm. How do we get people to see who we actually are in an uncomfortable situation? So, right. um, yeah, which there's nothing, uh, ill preparation is the fastest route for people to actually not get to see your authentic self when it comes to the stage. Yeah, so the way I, I think about it is there's like, there's the price of admission and that those are the things like, uh, don't say um, don't say ah, uh, make sure you're, you know, keeping your hands to your side at least a little bit or not overly animated. But then it, it, you, you go through the process too much and you become a robot and 
No one wants to show up and watch a robot speak yeah. to a group, unless unless they do. I'm sure it's happened somewhere, right? <laughs> Yeah, the, the unique experience of seeing a robot speak is kind of cool, I suppose, until Alexa, I guess Alexa kind of ruined that for everyone. Well, don't say her name too loud because she chimes in all the time. <laughs> uh, the other piece is you mentioned that there is a, a leading speaker on millennials. Who do you think that is? Because I don't, I, that, when you say that, a name doesn't pop to mind. Yeah, well, and it's actually interesting because it, it teaches you about the market. But um, my mentor and a person who, is, who I certainly, uh, I can't say enough good things about, Jason Dorsey. Uh, and he's 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 got a fascinating story. He is, um, it's it's funny because, on the one hand, he is actually he's not so he has not worked in to create a public platform as in a, a, a uh, to the customer, not a business to customer person. Right. And I think that's one of the interesting things people don't understand about the speaker market or wanting. I want to speak more. That means they think they need to have a bigger following on social media. They need to hire a PR company. And, and not to say those things can't help, but, um, you know, I came the number of times people come up to me and say, like, I want to speak. Well, I, I did a, I mean, I was on TV once <laughs> or, or even like I'm a daily contributor on TV. That's not where people don't look and say, oh, that person whose name I can't recognize, he commented on something that happened one time on CNBC. Like, that's not where we think about getting a speaker. And so right. Jason um, is someone who is really an expert and thought leader in the corporate market, understanding generational trends to companies. And so his, all, of his, um, all of his marketing and his voice is directed that way, which means he's not famous, but yet he's extremely influential. So when you say uh, generational transformation, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, I, I think I said, I, what I really just said was um, my words too fast and close to um, okay. I, I said generational trends. Yeah, he, generational uh, trends. Okay. Yeah, understanding trend, the trends that shape generations and and how that impacts businesses in real ways, and um, also what it's not and what it isn't is um, every person of a certain age being exactly the same as someone else of that age. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and that's that's one thing I get all the time, right? So they say, okay, based on your age, you should be these seven things, and that's just not always the case. I'm probably yeah. three other things, you know. Uh, but that being said, you know, it's it is something that companies are talking about all the time. Like you go online, there's no shortage of people talking about millennium conundrums or like uh, other other generations having negative feelings or even like the joke videos that come out about oh, yeah. like, hey, this is this is how this age of people act. And some of them are pretty funny because like you've seen it, you've you've observed it in nature yeah. before, right? That's right. That's right. So. Yeah. You're, so you're, you're, let's move into the speaking part. So now you're, you're speaking so often that it's, it's become a bottleneck. And we were talking about this before the podcast comes on. It's like uh, when we talk to entrepreneurs, you spend your whole life building this thing and it's, you can't wait to, to get it to go. And now you're at the point where it's going so fast that it's becoming a, a, a bottleneck of time. So how do you describe that? What, what were the... What were the tipping points where you just were like, oh my gosh, this is a lot? Yeah, and, and you know, I think at every stage in a business, there's always this feeling of like, we're ap operating beyond capacity, um, unless you're in like a really, really large company, um, which is a totally different ballgame. Because the reality is, is that if you're not operating way beyond capacity, then hiring someone uh, is a pretty poor use of resources. Right. right. And, you know, so it's a, it's, it's a challenge. For, for us, what has happened is I, um, you know, I've been speaking quite a long time pretty frequently, but I released the book and the book did well. And so the book has really uh, shifted the volume of inquiries and, and people that are asking for time. And in the process, what that has done is it has eliminated my capacity to do things that otherwise would, um, create deeper opportunities with really cool clients. Okay. And so basically it's really hard um, when, when the way we've had to message and, and uh, create awareness has really been all around my individual platform, mm -hmm. even though I'm not the only person who's a part of the team. And, and so when, when that is the case, when people have an experience that they say they wanna have my involvement from a pricing structure, uh, it's hard to go beyond a keynote because the keynote has a, a unique pricing structure and um, but that also eliminates other things that we'd like to do. So 
um, we're working really hard and we, I, have, I have a great team and then a great, um, like a great core team and then a great team that's one step removed that we're looking to move into more um, exclusively doing stuff with us rather than being um, a contractor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, that means really for us, we have a vision to do three things. One, um, one part of that is the, you know, continuing to do keynotes and workshops. Right. And I love that. We love it. I, I think it's. I, I think in today's distracted world, the power of like a captive audience having a live experience actually is one of the most uh, in, important and critical ways to create shifts in, in conversation. Agree. Um, so that's part one for us. And then part two is that we want to do a better job of of providing ways of interacting with our content that isn't that. So that means um, doing things like this podcast and and online. Um, training and, and having uh, ways of, pro of being available and letting people connect with us in other ways. And then the, the biggest thing we're working on is, is really just the natural follow up of the stuff we speak about. Our, our stuff is not just about self help focus. It's all around the um, organizational and team distraction. And how do we how do we make sure that we're setting up teams and we're um, making decisions in the systems that we exist within to actually facilitate focused work rather than to uh, exacerbate the problems that the constantly connected workplace brings. So basically implementations. Uh, gotcha. How does this come into, how do, how do we bring this into organizations? How do we assess and how do we, how do we help them? So your website says you speak about 75 times a year. So when it says speaking, it yeah. sounds like it's more than just speaking, it's workshops and follow-ups and this is probably a multi-day activity, is that correct? Well, unfortunately, it, for me, it hasn't been able to be that. Um, so when they say 75 times speaking, I spoke 50 times in keynotes up to half days. I will do full days, although we have to limit them because of travel stuff. Um, but from June, January to June, I, I did 50 engagements. And so that would have been, uh, most of them would have been keynotes, which is up to 75 to 90 minutes. Usually they're around 60 minutes. Right. And then, um, you know, with workshops that are more extended keynotes throughout. So yeah, that's, that's the idea, but we're having to cut back on the back half because I, I'm going to die if I keep at that pace. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, what's that? Six months of being on the road. Uh, yeah, it's two days of speech is the best way to think about it on average. Yeah. That, and so one thing that I found is extremely, extremely exhausting. And even from doing these podcasts, just one hour at a time in the comfort of my own house, it's like incredibly exhausting to talk for an hour. Did you did you have a uh, did you did did you have any learning curves with this? Because obviously you're like writing the speeches, you're coaching the speeches, and then yeah, like there was probably a, a ramp up time for you where you were like doing it once a week or doing it once every other week, and then all of a sudden it's it's two a week for six months in every city and I you know another thing people don't really realize if they're not doing it is traveling on top of this can oh, be very exhausting. Amazing. Yeah yeah um, well it, it's interesting I'm, I'm always exhausted speaking and I'm also always like excited I'm pumped up it's a combination but I, I think one time I had an extended member of my family that said gosh I want to have Kurt's job he's got the easiest gig he just talks. Um, <laughs> And I'm like, well, you try it. <laughs> the the uh, like so yesterday I did two 75 minute speeches, and and I mean I could hardly complete words at the end of it. And, right. and the reason is it, is it just takes every ounce of focus, and um, to maintain audience's attention means that your jokes have to be really on your um, your mannerisms have to be a little bit more exaggerated. You just fully present. And that never is not exhausting for me. That's always, every time I, I'm done speaking, I've given every ounce of energy I have. I'm always exhausted. I'm also miserably bad at sleeping on the road. And so I am typically quite exhausted. Um, I don't sleep well on the road. It, so, you know, there's a six month period of no sleep and that was really uh, not good for any other aspect of life. Absolutely. Um, I, so I haven't really adjusted to it. The only ways I've adjusted to it is I've adjusted by um, getting fluency on stage and comfort with the content uh, to the point that I, I can operate at a high level while on stage, even if I cannot operate at a high level at other times. And so that is something that I've, I've gained over the course of um, the last six years or five years of going from no speeches to 
think it's great for something. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So like before we hopped on the podcast, I watched some of the stuff that is you on YouTube and some of the stuff on focusright.com. And it is uh, legitimately, you can I can see if I'm looking for it, how difficult this would be to do. And so when someone says, uh, he, he, I wish I had Kurt's job, all he does is talk. <laughs> like the, the what I would say back to that is, I wish I had the, uh, like, I was going to say, I wish I had the janitor's job, because all you got to do is mop, right? That's right. It's like anything you do at this level of repetition and at that level is going to be exhausting. Um, That's right. Brings me to the next thing I wanted to, to talk to was the actual content that you are have developed the expertise around, which is talking about a distracted culture. I had my niece and nephew out. To, I live in Austin, as you know. Uh, we actually, I used to live in Frisco, and you used to make fun of me for living in Frisco because it wasn't downtown. Remember that? I, I, I've, you are not the only one who I've had to um, come back and, and eat humble pie around. <laughs> well, I, that's a five-year-old memory right there. So I have my niece and nephew out to Austin, and they're on their phones or on the Fortnite game or uh, watching a TV with very little breaks in between. And so I'm remembering... When I was when I was little, it wasn't that much different. Like I would I would work on Mario for like eight hours and then move to NBA Jam. Like that was that was my version of this. Um, but when I was doing that, it was solitary or like at very most it would be a social event with one other friend. And then uh, Super Nintendo came out with the multi tap where you could connect four controllers. You ever play that madness? <laughs> I didn't play that one, but I played it in other places. Yeah, I played it in like when the um like Halo when that came out in college, that was the play. Yes, that's a new breed of it. But I'm just, I'm like, I'm thinking back on the same time frames of my life that now is completely different because where it was max of one, it was solitary or it was with one other person, now it's with the whole planet. And it's absolutely insane because when you engage with the entire planet, they're talking back to you at unprecedented rates. So I was watching one of the promo videos on your website and it's, uh, the inbox is filling up to like a thousand emails over the course of the two minutes of the, the video. And I get several hundred emails a day and, and text messages and notifications from everything. Uh, what is your take on, on how to kind of manage this and what's your over, over like essentially a high level view of, of what you talk about? Yeah. Um well, I think that it's important to realize that, that, that a lot of the conversation here is uh, not with us, but just the bigger conversation in culture, I think is overwhelmingly not helpful on these issues. Um, there's a lot of people that are, that one, we want to blame technology, Silicon Valley, they're manipulating us, they're addicting us. Uh, number two, um, we should all feel guilty when you throw away our phones. Um, but but uh, there's several things that I, I think are really important when we approach this. Mm -hmm. that we, we have to understand. And the first one for me is that we need to make sure that the model that we're using uh, or the ideal we're using is one that we actually want to have and nobody questions that. So for instance, at work, um, I'm typically brought in, uh, I'm really brought in for two reasons, but um, either one it's to reach a distracted customer, but the primary one is how do we get more productive? How do we get more focused, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what they're really saying is, so what I want to challenge there is um, what is the model? And for most people, the model is, um, if I could just do, I could, if I could just be more disciplined, if I could knock out more things, if I could never get distracted, I, I never get interrupted. But what they're really saying is I, I like the perfect employee is a computer, right? Like that. And, and we have this completely unrealistic picture of how we're actually wired to work. And so, um, we just need to realize the reason we, we go to our phones and we go to our phones, one, because we're curious and there's new information, there's interesting things out there. Yes. So rather than saying I need to turn it off, I need to say what am I trying to get out of it and is it accomplishing that? I think that's the real core question I'm asking. Is, and so I would say that the best model for us to think about is that we are actually uh, wired to be explorers. We're wired for curiosity. And the problem isn't that we're curious. The problem is that the technology provides infinite exploration when we only are made or wired to, to explore incrementally. And, and what I mean by that is um, we have, um, we're always aware of there's some amount of information out there that if we had it, we would be able to make a better decision. 
that, mm-hmm. that we actually, we, we set ourselves up as if we should be able to um, explore infinite opportunities. We should be able to answer infinite questions. We should be able to know infinite amounts of information. And the problem is we're not infinite. And so instead, if we can just give that up, then we actually have a chance to get our attention back where it needs to be. So, you know, that's, the, that's kind of the first part. I, I, I'm getting long-winded here uh, because I, I, I love this stuff. But hey, we got time, other, Kurt. This is the internet, man. Cool. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're talking to a, a distracted customer <laughs> and so, or distracted consumer. Yeah, and that, 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 I'll just interlude here real quick. And so have you, have you noticed the resurgence of the long-form narrative online yeah. or in any, any yeah. place? And I think yeah. that's just, it's especially where I'm trying to play is because we, there's no cutoff on time. There's no commercial break coming up. No one's, uh, well, unless one of your kids comes in the room, there will be no distraction. So there's, what do you, what do you make of that resurgence? Because the, yeah. the, the most popular the, podcasts are those types of podcasts now. Took it along. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things that are taking place there. And, and one of them is the fact that uh, the reaction to a lot of this world, it, it almost makes us either we should be machines or we are just animals. And um, in, in that sense, it really undervalues our humanity and uh, what we really need. Um, what that means is like the biggest thing that drives what we pay attention to is social connection. Um, the things that we're, the people that we're around shape what we pay attention to, shape what we ignore. And in that sense, long form narrative creates a much deeper social connection. It, it, it helps us to be a part of a story. So that's mm-hmm. part one. But I actually think the even more important place that people seem to be forgetting is the utility of long form narrative in audio form. And what it does is it, it um, you know, there's, there's only, people have probably heard like either uh, that they're great at multitasking, which is a lie, or that they, uh, multitasking is a myth, which is also not true either. The truth is it depends on which tasks you're doing. And the thing that audio provides is it provides the, uh, the ability for us to engage ideas, the, the most human ideas is the best way I could, like engage stuff that matters to us mm-hmm. while we do stuff that doesn't matter to us. So we can drive and listen to long form audio. We can clean the house and listen to long form audio. And so this is, the, this is in some ways more evidence of a, of, a, of a consumer that is used to noise. But on the other hand, it's also optimistic in that it's saying, hey, this isn't all bad. It's good to engage deep stuff at a, at a level that um, actually uh, uh, facilitates curiosity rather than stifling into short, um, short, short formats without real context. Gotcha. So, and you also, you also mentioned that you spend a lot of time talking about the millennial thing. And so I, we got to hit that real quick and you don't have to belabor it because like I said, there's no shortage of people talking about this. What is, what is your take on the millennial conundrum and, and what's the solution or is there even really a problem at all? Yeah, I, I think that there's multiple la- multi-layered there. Um, the, the reason that I've moved towards attention is because I think that what has at times been accused as of a men, being a millennial challenge is actually um, is actually a shifting cultural challenge that is not limited to a single generation. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really the reason I've gone that way. That it's not just millennials that are distracted, who, that have short attention spans, that can't seem to focus, that are struggling with real deep questions around meaning and work and effort. Um, it's it's a human one and. You know, if we wanted to look, say, what are the distinct millennial challenges? What is unique to being a millennial? Uh, you know, I would say it, this isn't, uh, by the way, I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone. This is my perspective. I would say we, are, we live in a moment where this pace of change is, is, has moved to such, uh, has sped up to such a level that those that are leading from older generations operate with a, with a totally different mentality in the way they measure work and mm-hmm. the way they expect you to engage them in the structures of authority that they have. And it's not whether one's right or wrong, but, but a world with the type of information that we have available to us, um, it, seem, it runs counter. So you have a millennial generation who uh, simply doesn't understand the ideas that an older generation in charge has classically said are really important, and that can create serious conflict. Gotcha. Um, now, you know, you asked me on the other side, what are the challenges for millennials and the younger generations? I, I think every challenge can 
uh, for me, uh, can be brought back to the question of how do we engage as humans in an increasingly automated and technological world? How do we grow the skills that digital loses? Um, how do we make sure that we are actually um, not handing over uh, the things that actually bring about what it is that we want to, um, to convenient uh, outsourcing and not realizing we're also outsourcing the things that, that really create meaning. Absolutely. And so one of the most popular topics we talk about on this podcast is AI and what that will do to the, to the future of work, to the future of relationships. So in your opinion, again, you don't need to speak for anybody else, but yourself, what, what do we do there? You know, I, so, I mean, I, I, I'm definitely aware of the long term conversations on this stuff. I, I, I think, so I'll just punt for other people on, in terms of like what happens when artificial intelligence is smarter than us in every way. I, I, um, are we going to lose all our jobs? I, you know, there's a lot of history that says we're, that's never happened. This uh, technology seems to change the nature of jobs. But right. for me, I, I actually think um, where there's an advantage um, and, and the, the value proposition for us, for people, have to be in the things that, ought, that machines can't do, will never do. Uh, it can't be in saying we need to hold back because machines can do this and it's we're losing jobs. We're losing jobs. So what, do, what will people pay a premium for? And what we see from my, like a distracted consumer standpoint is they'll pay a premium for experiences. Um, they'll pay a premium for connection, a human connection. And so you, I would say, yeah. Can you make an example of experiences and connection? Yeah, um, I, I, the biggest country record label in country music is a client. And they'll tell you that, I mean, this is a really obvious example, but like used to, they would make their artists go to concerts to sell albums. Now they have albums so that they, people will go to concerts. Because when, when industries are becoming commoditized, anything, anything, uh, that we don't want to do, we'll find the cheapest route, which usually is going to be machine, right? Right, uh, and that's anything, historically accurate as well. Yeah, but on the other hand, there's some things that will, like, we'll go to really inconvenient links to hear a singer. We could listen to them on our iPod or our iPhone for free, but we go there because we want to have the experience of being with other people doing something that we couldn't do anywhere else. And so how do we create? Um, we will pay for experiences that celebrate something unique. Um, you, we have to make the physical case for why something should be at this location. Um, uh, otherwise, we won't pay for it. So, like, that's what I mean by experiences. We'll pay right. to, we'll continue to pay for, for experiences. Um, and then on the, on the connection thing, I, I, I you know, I could give a, a few, but I, I will go to McDonald's because it's convenient. But I'll go to my local restaurant that I, this, I went to uh, this Italian restaurant. I paid a crazy amount of money. But when I was there, it's an Italian family. Uh, there's, uh, there's, you know, they, they, they cultivate an experience. It felt like when my wife and I were in Florence, it was our anniversary. Like, we're paying for an experience. We're paying for people. They're helping us have that experience. So uh, the reason I think this is really important is because uh, if you want to have value in a world that's so automated, then you better know... Um, you better not do the things that actually make you lose value, which is uh, not being good at communication. <laughs> you right. have to be good at connecting to people, um, forming tight social bonds and a cohesive uh, culture, being a part of something that, uh, being a part of really um, all agrees on what matters. Like isolation is the fastest route to losing all value in this world that we're living in, like being on your own, being on an island, you, you, not only will you be unhappy, but people won't even have to see any value in what you're doing. Yeah, that's a really wild thing because every, uh, everything seems to be, when I say everything, you, you're following me, it's so many things are pushing you to be able to do your entire existence in your, in your bathrobe, in, yeah. in your living room, right? Yep. And so when you look at that and say, you know, we're talking human condition, like isolation is not good for the human from what I right. can see statistically. And so why do we keep pushing these things and why do these things that give you greater isolation keep gaining so much momentum? And if you've thought about this, and I'm sure you have, where is the breaking point? Well, the reason is because 
uh, or in my mind, the lens through which we talk about this and think about this mm -hmm. uh, is because people are inconvenient. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> the weird thing about social connections is that um, we need them. It's fundamentally like the way our attention decision. I mean, we could talk about it even as an infant. Like, there's no doubt. Like, to be, um, like, to be a person means to be social. Like, we exist in the context of other people. But those people stay longer than we want them to stay. They say things that we don't want them to say. They um, they betray our confidence. They um, you know they don't they mess up our favorite toy. Like, they they're just people are annoying, right? So if I can have a relationship that allows me to get the benefits, get vaccinated. So I, I get a reward in the form of dopamine when I send a message or when I receive a message. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and what's really happening there is like attention is, uh, is a matter of selection around what matters. And so when someone says, I'm going to talk to you, they're saying, I'm giving you my attention and they're saying you matter. Right. But if I can get that without the consequences, meaning I don't have to, um, I can turn you off when I want. Right. I, can, or I don't have to have I any fail you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the thing about it is, is that's really convenient. It feels good. It's nice. The problem is um, what is immediately helpful and then what actually creates a, it's just like no one, um, in a marathon, no one would say that's something you're, that's fun, but it's deeply satisfying. And it's, as humans, we, we, we have this wrestle that naturally occurs between what, um, what, what will help us survive at the moment and will, what will actually allow us to thrive in the long term. And so I just think we're in this wrestling with, with what this looks like. And, you know, if I were to guess, and I don't have a clue, um, I, I, think, I think we're going to see something similar to what's happened with, with food and, and, and exercise. Um, people are getting fatter, um, but there's a growing movement. 46% of people have worked out, work out on a weekly basis at least. Um, eating healthy is a much bigger cra craze. And I think the same thing's gonna happen with communities and our relationship with technology, that we'll see healthier boundaries, better standards, while recognizing that a large segment of people, unfortunately, are gonna um, cave to their, you know, cave to the Twinkies. <laughs> so you don't see it as a breaking point. You see it as like, uh, there will be a tapering and an adjustment. That's, yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Uh, uh, black swan or unforeseen global event notwithstanding. I think we're just going to see a, a, a subtle shifting. Um, and I think we're already seeing it, honestly. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that to some extent, but you don't know if it's a macro trend or a micro trend, right? So like I look at I look at Snapchat and I'll take grief for knocking on Snapchat. I don't like Snapchat. It's a terrible and, platform. And the reason is, is because it's designed to make your attention last 15 seconds or whatever the limit is on it. and. Yeah. I just I, I see that in the hands of kids, and I'm like, well, this isn't this isn't what's going to work for you in a few years. But you're catering to this uh, this medium, right? And so, yeah. if there is this tapering and there is this uh, reversion to the mean, then things like that should, in theory, go away, right? And so, Instagram was bought for a billion dollars by Facebook. That was pretty well publicized. I think it might have been more. Uh, the internet will let me know. Now. Yeah, the internet will let me know for sure. Um, but if Snapchat is is looking at those valuations now, do you think, based on this summation, that it should be a lower lower price because the future prospects are lesser? Well, um, so I have strong opinions on this, and I need to caveat it with I'm definitely not a financial services person, and so I'm not making a stock pick. With that said, I, I also don't know where the stock price is currently, but I, I think there's, like 12, for me, there's several reasons. Yeah, so I, whether that's valued, overvalued or not in the short run, I don't know. Um, I, I, I have always thought Snapchat in particular has some real challenges. Um, one is it, it has a really tough user experience. Um, so that's really, it's not, it's not easily navigable, which goes against everything else that um, we're seeing. Uh, number two. Some people can no, navigate it. Yeah, well, yeah, totally. You can learn to navigate it, but like in okay. terms of getting old, like getting um, mass buy-in, eh, un unlikely. Um, I also think that it ha it lacks stickiness in the sense that um, what Facebook and Instagram have been able to do is they are now um, they're now the resting place for years and years of our lives, and uh, so that means that even if we stop using them actively, I think they have some real real depth of power. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think those are a couple things that are that are pretty challenging about Snapchat. I also um, 
I, I think that in general, there is going, we, we will continue to see a place for short form and long form um, types of connection and communi uh, communication. I, I think that's going to continue. Um, a, a, a short form only that has a, that appealed to a young demographic um, using things that others now do, but also provide a better experience and deeper ways of connecting. I think that they're in trouble. That's, that's the long story short. I, I don't think Snapchat's going to be, um, a, there's not something I'm going to buy long term, but um, yeah, so that's, that's my thought. Fair enough. All right. Well, I'll let you off the hook on that one because I'm just not a fan and I, I think it's, yeah. I think it's actually harmful to the yeah. development of kids essentially. Um, different story. But so with the, with the few minutes we have left, I'd love to get into the book itself. So it's called, Can I Have Your Attention? Amazon bestseller. And that is, that is huge, man. Congratulations on that. Um, there's, uh, you had a, a co-author, uh, Jonathan McKee. Yes. Uh, and so, when you're writing a book, tell me about the preparation process from the from the point where you say, "Okay, I want to do this." Uh, I've had a couple of people come to me after these podcasts and say, "Because we've had a couple of people on that have written books," and it seems to me that there are a lot of different ways to go about starting. So traditional mentality would say write an outline and then expand on the outline and then tell me tell me how you did it. Yeah, well, I, I, there's two parts. There's one, there's the getting the book deal side and then two, there's the actual script. So um, I, 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 I'm a believer depending on goals that um, for me, the, the, the book proposal process was both helpful for me to organize thinking and, you know, get to a, a, a table of contents, sample chapters, but also the marketing plan. And then we, we got a book deal. So I tend to say, um, don't write a whole book, do a book proposal because you don't want to waste the months and months of, of misery if you can't find someone who will produce it unless you're going to do it on your own. So with that yes. said, who published your book, a by book, the way? Wiley. Published Wiley. Okay. Yeah. I only have the digital copy, so I don't, didn't remember. You're good. Yeah. No, no big deal. They're a New York publisher. They've been good to me. They have great, they have great, um, they were, they were the right fit for us. They do a lot of, uh, top, top business book sale sellers. They're really, really good in that space. Great. Um, so for me, the process then was, uh, back up a little bit though, because it's the book proposal. Uh, tell yeah. us about that. So you, you write a sample chapter or you write a prologue or, and you put a table of yeah. contents. Is that it? What does that look like? Yeah, there's a, so I, I had a literary agent that w I was connected to uh, before I was even thinking about writing a book. So I, I, I followed that, his lead. And, um, but there's a lot of different book proposals, uh, like templates out there. And ultimately what you're doing is you're saying, why would this book be a good decision for a publisher? So, you know, one sentence summary, paragraph summary, um, who's going to endorse the book, um, what's the marketing plan, meaning like how are you going to get it, how many books are you going to sell and how are you going to sell them, what's your social influence, what's the, like how are you going to, how are you, is anybody going to know about this book? If you, as if you were not, um, like depending on a publisher to sell any books is, is really unrealistic today. Uh, people don't want to buy from a publisher, they want to buy from the person. Um, and so the publisher's job is distribution, uh, uh, printing and distribution. And so, um, yeah, so that was the, that, that process was basically really important for honing like the title of the book, which by the way, the publisher then changed because um, they have a team that helps and I liked the title that they came up with more than mine. I think- What was the original title? title? Was, um, um, I, it, we wrestled between your people aren't working and nobody's working um, and they wanted me to go positive on it, which I think they were right about. Um, so, we got approved and then um, I basically took the speech, the table of contents and uh, like I, I literally had um, just, I use Evernote mainly, just pay hundreds of, of speech notes and articles and um, scanned book chapters and I just started organizing them. Um, organizing them into big themes and then into uh, chapters under that theme and then uh, once I started doing that, I then, then basically said, I think these are the chapters. And then I, Jonathan looked at it and said, I agree or I don't agree. And we got the chapters right. And then a brief summary of each chapter. 
And then I proceeded to do an extremely detailed outline um, that was then, you know, iterated upon until we then put pen to paper and, and wrote out each chapter and then sent it to an editor and then sent it to another editor and then had friends review it. And, um, and that, in the end, it, it was late by a month, but Wiley was nice. And then we started the process of promotion, which was basically ask your friends to tell other people to buy the book. <laughs> uh, well, that's what that's when I got the book. Is mm -hmm. it was it wasn't even you. It was one of uh, some common person on social media that said you were doing it, and I was like, oh, I remember Kurt. I'll buy his book. Done. Thank you. <laughs> uh, perfect. So tell me about promotional though, because that is that's a black box that the average person yeah. doesn't know anything about. Yeah, I mean, ultimately. Uh, I, I, I've, I've been able to escape having to be self-promotional my whole career, and I, I don't like it, but at some point you have to say, do I believe in this enough to ask people to support it? And so for us, the right. plan was really getting companies that had booked me for speeches to mm -hmm. buy books or even to do negotiated rates of speaking for book sales, plus then basically gathering all my friends and emailing everyone that it was it has been like I uh, that have signed up to stay in touch with me through... Um, the work that I'm doing and, and saying, hey, we need to have a team of 30 people who will help be more proactive. We then have a team of like 100 that will at least post on social media the day of. And then we have everyone else that I'm hoping will buy somewhere between one and 1,000 books <laughs> mm -hmm. per person. So, so when you say uh, negotiated speaking rate, so that means they, in, in accompaniment of you coming on as the speaker, they also agree to buy 70 books. Yes. That's right. Gotcha. Okay. And so do those books come directly from Amazon, which, you know, helps Depends. the statistics roll that way? If it was Wiley, um, if it was a big enough book sale, Wiley would, would source it through like Barnes and Noble or something. Um, right. But if it was uh, anything from about 200 down was, we would we'd have, uh, we just have them go to Amazon and buy. Yeah. Gotcha. So <clears throat> one of the, one of the things I love to focus on when we're doing these podcasts is like tactical advice from an expert on how to address some some unknown territory and sure if i am if i'm wanting to write a book and kurt steinhorst was kind enough to give me an hour of his time and tell me about his story what would you think uh would be the next thing that i need to do um to to get going on that so we mentioned the outline we'll wrap this up real quick uh, yeah. so what do i what do i do We're starting right now I think the key is knowing what your topic is. Like, what is the core message and how is it something that is of interest and how does it hit a felt need? Well, so I would, if I've got the idea to write a book, we'll, we'll make that table stakes. And then so say, I've got the idea, I've yeah. got the topic, I want to move forward. What do I do? Um, I, I, would, I would go online, find how to put together a book proposal, just book proposal template. I think Mike, Michael Hyatt, I think, has a good one. And I would start piece by piece literally following paint by numbers on a book proposal template and let that be the one and then you know and then get a little far enough along and, and ask five people you respect whether they think it's compelling but yeah the the key is find the um find the book proposal template and and actually create your own using that and once i get that template what where do i send it and if, if i'm happy with what i've put there i've spent a lot of time well, in my yeah. preparation what's next well, you send it to people like me who can send it to literary agents. So um, basically you would send it to probably me. And if you have any other friends that have connection to the book world, I mean, that's how I did it. I, I literally said, who do I know that's written a book? Who do I know that? Uh, and I asked them for, and you know, if the proposal's at a point that someone can say yes or no, then it's an easy forward. If, a, if it's way earlier than that, then all of a sudden what happens is the person who probably doesn't have time isn't gonna be able to use their time to do that. So that's the, the big key there. Gotcha. All right, man. I appreciate that. That's step one to write a book if you're thinking about it. Um, Kurt, appreciate you coming on. Uh, we'll talk soon and we'll take it from there.